Don't forget to tell us where you're watching from today and what your favorite sports team is. I'm now going to turn our time over to our moderator, Molly Mazzolini. Thanks, Chelsea, and hello all. Today, we welcome our panelists to talk about the business of sports. They represent three distinct perspectives, sponsor, professional team owner, and collegiate athletics. And the best part is that they're all alums from the David Eccles School of Business. Each one is super accomplished, and here is a brief yet mighty intro about them. And then we'll jump right in to our discussion, followed by a Q&A session. So be ready to enter your questions via the chat feature. First up, Annie Leiter, Vice President of Sponsorships for Zions Bank. Annie oversees the corporate sponsorship portfolio. Her role bookends the entire process from partner relationship management to asset fulfillment. Annie is a part of every phase from strategy to execution. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Marketing in 2011, and in 2018, Annie earned her MBA from Westminster College. Annie currently serves on the board of Wise Utah and the Bloom Gala Committee for the Utah Community Actions Head Start Program. Hello, Annie. Next up, Charlie Monfort, owner and general partner of the Colorado Rockies baseball team. Charlie has a baseball, a bachelor, sorry, not a baseball degree, we've got that too, a bachelor's degree in marketing and business management, and while on campus served as president of the Kappa Sigma fraternity. Upon graduation, Charlie returned to Colorado to work at the family business Monfort International Sales Corporation, and under his guidance, it became one of the largest beef exporters in the world. After a merger with Conagra and term as president, Charlie resigned in the late 90s in order to concentrate on his leadership role as one of the founders and managing general partners with the Rockies. And with all of that, he makes time to give back to his beloved Colorado community through the Monfort Family Foundation, as well as serving on the Special Olympics Board of Directors, the Denver Dream Program, and the U of U as an advisory board member. Joining us from Greeley, Colorado, hello, Charlie. By, by the way, I, I, my, when we win, that's my part. My brother's part is when we lose. All right. Just, Got it. Got okay. it. Excellent clarification. Excellent clarification. And finally, Steve Smith, Senior Athletics Director, sorry, Senior Associate Athletics Director for Business and CFO of Utah Athletics. Steve Smith has worked for the University of Utah Athletics Department in various roles for over 15 years. He started out as an accounting clerk and currently serves as the CFO for the department. He graduated in 2005 with a bachelor's degree in accounting before continuing his education by receiving his MBA in 2009. Hello, Steve. Thank you all so much for being here. We're so excited to kick this off. And today's topics were curated from questions the viewers, you, submitted via the RSVP link. So here are the top five sport business topics that we're going to talk about today. COVID, data and analytics, athlete salaries, young professionals, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So getting started, COVID. The date, March 11th, 2020, has been coined by some as the day that sports died. I think many of us will remember where we were when we heard the news that the Thunder versus Jazz game was postponed literally before tip off because Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID. Here we are 10 months later and we're questioning, will sports return to what they were before COVID and will fans come to games? And how are we all adapting to sports being one of the top 10 industries suffering because of this global pandemic? So Steve, starting off with you, what are the long-term impacts on college sports due to COVID-19? And how has your organization reinvented itself to stay connected to fans? Thank you, Polly. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. Excited that to have so many people listening and, and hope we can gain some uh, valuable insight in, uh, in athletics and the sports industry. So 
Um, but regarding COVID, uh, it was certainly a, it's going to be a financial challenge. It's going to be with us for many years. Uh, right now, we're projecting about a 35 to $40 million loss for fiscal year 21, which ends June 30th of this year, and then trying to dig out from underneath that. Um, I would say right now, we're, we're kind of really still in that shock and awe period where we're still trying to figure out exactly what, what it all means for this, for, for us. You know, um, The debt service on that on that loan, let's say we assume a loan for that $40 million deficit. Um, the debt service will be about four and a half million dollars a year over the next 10 years. And that's that's gonna be quite a challenge to find a way to pay that. Um, and so I think that there's gonna be some really strategic ways in which schools are gonna go about this. Uh, there's gonna be some challenges as far as, uh, you know, are they gonna postpone facility improvements? Um, are they gonna have to look at their coaching salaries? Are they gonna have to look at sports in general? Um, are they gonna be able to sponsor as many sports? And I think we've seen some of that already. You know, you've seen Stanford, for example, had to cut some sports, Minnesota, Iowa, you've seen some schools across the country. And, and that, that might ramp up a little bit. You know, I, I, uh, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate part of it, but, but it is something that I think schools are gonna to have to look at. Mm -hmm. um, you're, I think you'll see kind of a widening and, and gap uh, of the gap between some of the more, uh, you know, high level schools and some of the lower level divisions and so forth, you know, that, that monetary gap was already there and that's just going to expand uh, substantially after this year. You know, assume a donor comes in and wipes out the debt or the, or the deficit of an institution that would put that institution at quite an advantage going forward. You know, as, as coaches turn over, we'll have to look at that. We may have challenges retaining coaches, those kind of things. And so uh, COVID is going to really put a wrinkle into things for the next decade or so, uh, if not, if not more. Um, and it really, it's really been an interesting challenge and puzzle that we've had to kind of navigate. But I, like I said, we're, we're still trying to pick up the pieces from it and rebuild. As far as how we've reinvented ourselves to stay connected with our fans, you know, that's one question that's a big question about COVID. You know, will our fans come back? You know, I, I'm optimistic. I'm the, I, I try to be half glass full kind of guy. And, and I, I believe they will because there's nothing like being at the at Rice Eccles Stadium or the John M. Huntsman Center to watch um, the running newts or, or our football team or gymnastics team and volleyball, you know, or, or going to watch our soccer team or baseball team down at Smith ballpark. Right. We, we really believe that our fans will be back. There's just something about that. Um, but you don't know. And so we've tried to stay as connected as possible to our fans. We've tried to do some interesting zoom tailgates, for example, we've tried to do some, you know, different, different ways to engage them. I think one thing that COVID, if there's one good, good thing that's happened from COVID is it's really expedited the process of connecting with our fans through digital means. Uh, we, we maybe not will advertise as much through traditional paper methods or brick and mortar type methods or whatever, but more through social media and do highlight videos and those kind of things and really engage and really invest in those, those areas. So COVID has really kind of expedited that transition. Um, we're just trying to stay engaged and, and letting our fans really feel a part of this. Um, and, and we hope that when we're out, able to open those gates back up, that everyone comes flooding back and, and we can have that roar of that stadium again and, and really enjoy that game day atmosphere. So that's, that's our hope. And, and we just are just trying to stay positive and optimistic and moving forward. But uh, that's, those are my thoughts on COVID. <laughs> You're giving us goosebumps, Steve. We're, we all, we all want that again, sooner rather than later in a, in a safe environment for sure, for sure. And, um, and yeah, recently I saw all the advertising about the virtual huddle, which I thought was brilliant. Uh, so way to um, make that transition quickly to digital for Utah Athletics. Thank you. All right, so an extension of that and kind of how we're trying to figure out how fans will come to games is by looking at data. And you build trust through data and analytics and the trust of your fans, the trust of your team, the trust of your corporate partners. So Annie, how can brands use data during sponsor negotiations? Thank you, Molly. Um, it is so exciting to be here with you all today. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, data is um, has always been an important part of, of our sponsorship program, but becoming even more so. We really rely on data from our partners to help us understand which assets are performing well. Um, it's very difficult to calculate the ROI for a partnership, especially in a category like banking. Um, so we really choose to focus on that sponsorship asset performance, and we work really closely with our partners so that we can monitor our assets on an ongoing basis. Um, that way we can make tweaks and adjustments as we go or when we get to that point of negotiation and, and renewal. 
um, you know, for an example, before the pandemic, I started a process with the Utah Jazz, one of our partners, uh, where we'd receive monthly reports, um, actually detailing the performance of all of our assets. And so that data really helps inform our decisions as we go. Um, but then 2020 happened in the pandemic. And um, when sports started up again, that data became crucial for us to understand what, what was happening to our partnerships and our assets. Um, that, that was really important to us. So we actually hired an agency out of Denver um, back over the summer. Um, and they really helped us what we've called our COVID-19 impact evaluation project. Um, and they worked with us to really comb through every single data point that we received from, from our larger partners to understand that value that we were receiving or not receiving in some cases, um, you know, when those, those games were happening or in some cases when they were canceled. And that became really important to, to understand all that data um, when those games were happening, you know, if there were fans um, or if they were limited or if there were no fans at all, that, that all impacted the value of our assets. So really combing through understanding that, understanding that data was important. Um, and that then informed our negotiations so that we could decide um, you know, what, what value was lost or what assets were lost um, and then how do we go about recovering that. Um, from a monetary standpoint. So that data has been and, and will continue to be an important uh, part of our negotiations and, and crucial to really um, cohesive, um, true partnerships. Fantastic, thank you. And I think what's important to note there is that with the, you can have data, but if it doesn't mean anything to you or have meaning behind it for your business, um, there's really no point, right? Well, Charlie, you're on deck because you have so much data to comb through on and off the field of play, but just kind of taking the perspective on how you connect with your corporate partners, you know, how do you provide value to them by some of the data insights that you all have from, you know, the club organization perspective? Well, you know, <clears throat> our corporate partners like, like, and he mentioned uh, I, I, that's that's the key to all sports, in my opinion, because, you know, we we put the team out there. We we, we do as good as we can with the ability that they can. But it's our corporate sponsors, like Andy was discussing, um, to, you know, pay the bills. I mean, uh, quite frankly, they pay the bills, the, the fans pay the bills, um, and then them being kind of, um, you know, they're, they're the ones that they, they pay the salaries. So we need, we need to put the right team on the field, but we also need the corporate sponsors and stuff. Yeah. So it's important for people like Annie and what she does. And, and, and by the way, Steve, keep bringing up those good old ball players. So. Charlie needs them, Steve. Okay. We'll do our best. We're doing our best. I love it. Well, Steve, actually, you know, that's a great transition. How do you use data to optimize the student athlete performance? Okay. Molly. So uh, we have some software that we use uh, called Catapult um, or Shot Tracker. Catapult is, for example, it, it helps us uh, understand the endurance limits of our athletes. Uh, they wear the, these kind of contraptions that track their, their physicality and kind of their heart rates and those kind of things during the practice. And, and we use that to help us try to get peak performance out of our athletes and help them to, to kind of see what their endurance limits are. Uh, we also use other data sets, uh, software like Shot Tracker, for example, in our basketballs, where um, they can actually track the the locations of their shots and 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 what you know their kind of their percentages of makes and misses. And so we use a lot of really cool and inventive software to help us um, understand the performance of our athletes, and it really helps them kind of tweak some things. You know, maybe I, I need to kind of it, it's it's kind of like a racehorse or or something, you know, where you, you don't want to push the horse fast, you know, too quick, you know, but an athlete understands kind of what their stamina is and and maybe they need to not go hundred percent, you know, at certain times of a, of a competition and, and really kind of reserve that. So um, it's really kind of really uh, an interesting software that our, our analytics team and kind of our health performance team is using 
that really help our athletes to kind of get the best that they can out of their performance and endurance. So it's been really, really fascinating to see them uh, use that software for those purposes. Excellent. Thank you. And Charlie, earlier you mentioned salaries and um, a question from our audience is, do you see the salaries for professional athletes and coaches continuing to escalate? You know, yeah. Um, the, the problem we're facing is we've got 162 games, 81 games at home. And we, we're only going to have like... 20, 30,000 people there that we can accommodate because of the COVID. So it's, it's, it's going to be a little difficult to pay the players 100% of their salary. And our salary is going to be uh, 165 million. But anyway, and so to, to, to take care of that, with only 30, 40% of the stadium filled, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. So, um, yeah, um, it, it's, 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 it's delicate. It's, it's a tough, tough situation. Yeah. So, and I can just see your head spinning, like all the details that you have to think about as an owner and you're trying to like filter them all for us. So we understand in like a small succinct amount of time, but we love your behind the scenes take at it. Thank you. Well, uh, it's not very good. I don't, I don't know, but anyway, we'll get through it. We will, we will. And we know you will. Steve, how about from the collegiate football side of things? Should D1 college football players be paid salaries and benefits in line with their contributions to the sport? And both of these are really sensitive questions, you guys, by the way. So uh, they're doing their best to keep things, uh, you know, to kind of help educate you along the way. Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's a, obviously it's a very popular topic uh, right now. And yeah. I think it's a fair question. You know, um, demands, the time demands, particularly on our athletes, have never been greater. You know, they, they, they work so hard to really perfect and excel in the sports in which they play on um, and performing. And, and, you know, I think it's important as you, as you, you look at that question to really kind of understand um, what it is that, that athletes get um, when they're in college, you know, under a scholarship, you know. And so, you know, I, I put together a couple of numbers here just to kind of share, you know, a, a typical out-of-state scholarship, for example, has a value of around 47000 a year. Um, yeah. And that includes room and board. And, and there's a lot of ancillary benefits that also come with being a student athlete. So, for example, when they come on campus, we provide them a laptop. Um, you know, we have academic services, we have uh, uh, psychological and mental uh, health services, we have physical health, you know, they all insured or, or any, any sort of issues that come up or, you know, obviously the department covers. Um, there's various other things, you know, for example, if they want to get a snack or anything to eat, they can go down to our fueling station and, and, and grab, a, grab a bite to eat, you know, so our, our athletes, if you, if you kind of put all of that package together, you know, the value in any given annual year for a scholarship is probably around sixty to $65,000, right? So, so if, if you were to transition um, college athletics away from an amateur status, right, and became a professional model in which then our athletes would be on payroll, um, all of, most of that goes away, you know, from a budgetary perspective, there's no way that, there, you know, that both could be provided. Um, and if someone was on payroll and was receiving a scholarship, that would, that would become taxable. So there's also tax implications that would come into play. And so if you're, you know, if you're player X in position Y, and maybe you're a second or third string, and you're looking at maybe a $35 to $40,000 salary a year that's then taxed at, you know, whatever percentage, 15, 20%, um, you know, your take home pay is maybe 30. And, and you have a scholarship over here that's maybe a value of 65 to 70,000, you know, Maybe maybe you want the scholarship, right? And so it's it's a it's a really delicate situation. Now, don't get me wrong. There's players like you know Trevor Lawrence, you know for Clemson, right? And his value is obviously you know through the roof, right? He's probably going to be the number one draft pick. So so now there's there's there are le there's legislation that's happening right now. You've probably heard of name, image, and likeness. And I think I honestly think this is a great thing. I'm excited for our athletes to have an opportunity to be able to market themselves and to be able to generate some money. And to really kind of, um, you know, 
get that, you know, based on the value of what they, you know, how, how good a level of athlete they are. And so I think uh, we, we've partnered with a company called Influencer that's going to help our athletes brand themselves on social media and other ways in which they can then go out and, and acquire some sponsorships or find some ways to, to, to make some extra money based on their, their level of abilities, you know. And so as they transition from uh, the college ranks into professional markets, they, they can kind of ease into that transition. So I'm really excited about that. I think that's going to give our, our athletes a great opportunity to, to be able to, to really reap the benefits of their performance on the field or on the court or, or whatever. So, you know, it's, again, that's a, that's a really hot topic. And, and, but, uh, but I hope that I could provide some insight for, for those of you that maybe ask that question that you can kind of think on today and, and see where it might lie. You know, maybe it, maybe it makes sense here and, and maybe not so much there, depending on, on, on where you're at as far as your level. of uh, 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 Okay, Steve, not, not to interrupt, but um, I'll tell you what, that piece on Alex Smith, on 60 Minutes was incredible for, in my opinion, the University of Utah because the, if he came back and, and he's accomplished what he did accomplish through all the hard work and stuff. And that's a testament to the University of Utah on what you all stand for as an, you know, academic school and and what what he what he did and coming back from his injury you know that that that's stuff that needs to be sent out there because he did what he did because of the university of utah background oh i love it and megan and chelsea maybe you can put a link to that segment into the chat for the audience so they can view it after this after the panel don't be multitasking during our business of sport panel um, Charlie, that's awesome. And well, I, it, it was an incredible piece. And, and by the way, and I'll speak to Annie now, and, and it's because of supporters like them that, that believe in the U and yes. I believe in the U and you know what? Athletics is one thing, but it's, it's all about, there's more to it than that. So without a doubt. And, you know, transitioning now to young professionals, you know, a lot of people who are watching um, most likely want to get a job in the sports industry. And you have four people here who represent a spectrum of the sectors within that industry, collegiate, professional, sponsor, and creative consultant. You know, these are very different job styles and types, yet very collaborative, like a sport business team. And we can all confirm that this industry is not glamorous. It's hard, meaningful work. So with this in mind, I turn to Annie to tell us her story about how she started out as an intern and worked her way up. And then Charlie and Steve will circle back and talk to us a little bit about separating yourselves from other candidates. Annie? Thank you, Molly. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I, you're on. You're on, Nanny. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. I, um, you know, I, I'll back up. So I, when I was in at the U studying marketing, um, getting ready to graduate, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I, I started my internship at Zions Bank in marketing, and I, sponsorships were not even within the realm of possibilities for me. Um, I knew I just wanted to explore marketing, take my time, figure out what part of it I was interested in. And I was here in a great department where I had exposure to, to all the different areas and departments within, within our marketing team. Um, and so those first two years out of college, I had no idea this is where I'd be heading. Um, but sometime in between that internship and then my, my current sponsorship role, I was a marketing assistant. And I said in that time, it was, I was in that role for about two years. And I said, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves. I just want to learn everything I possibly can. Um, I supported a director at the time, but I also floated around supporting uh, that person's leadership team. And in that time, you know, I actively asked, you know, how can I learn? How can I offer to help? Um, what, what can I do to support this team? And so when the time came to add a role for sponsorships, um, a member of that leadership team advocated for me and put my name forward. And it's so crazy to think, I, I still am, um, 
I'm still shocked when I think back, you know, we had no one managing our sponsorships um, before I came into this role. It was a brand new position. Um, you think about everything that Zions Bank does in the community and it's pretty remarkable, but we had, it, it was very scattered. We had multiple people supporting that effort, that effort. And um, they said, you know, let, let's put a role together. And so I have been in this role now for, gosh, I think seven or eight years now. And it's, it's grown, it's changed, it's transformed in so many ways. Um, but it, it's been so much fun. But um, I, I, I never imagined that sponsorships would be an area that I would be heading towards and absolutely loving. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I think it gives so many insights to those who are listening that you may not necessarily know where you want to go. Um, and sometimes it just finds you or you get the opportunity to be able to build it yourself, like becoming the very first role in the organization, such as what you're doing now. And Molly, so, could, I, could I add I mean, something? Could I yeah. add something? And I, I just have to say, you know, sponsorships is a very interesting component of the sports business industry. Um, you're not working directly with a team. You're not working directly with athletes. Um, you get to be on a very fun side of this business. You get this exposure and this engagement with these teams and these organizations. Um, but I, I, you know, I fortunately don't have to be every single game for a season, um, you know, with, with some of our partners, you know, there's, there's work that goes into that, but um, it's, it's a really fun, interesting side of the sports business world that um, I think people should not rule out if that, that's an interest of you. Fantastic. So Charlie, if you were, you know, mentoring someone who is either in the sports industry or is looking to get into the sports industry, what would you tell them, like some of the qualities that you look for, um, not, you know, for like the business operation side of the, the professionals that you bring onto your team? Um, uh, I, I, Annie brought it up very well. The, the fact that you can um, get into the sports industry, which by the way, I think are uh, uh, entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Entrepreneurial. Yeah. <laughs> um, ship um, at, at the U is, is incredible because that's, and we're getting into the sports business um, you know, I, I, I think that that's that's the way to start. And unfortunately, and we've talked about this, um, you, you can't do internship really in baseball because it's summertime. Right, right. And, and so so it doesn't work out so well because um, the, the, the fact is, our people are working during the summer, so right. it, it, it doesn't work at all. But but I I think I think what Annie's done is is the way to go and just start functioning and um, like Utah, they they've got that they're getting a business school that has to do with um, sports, so. I, I, I think that's that's critical. Thank you. And and Steve, I know you have a huge, um, you know, and very strong. Yeah, Steve business. would know better than me if they're doing that. Or the internship program, right? At the athletics? Right. Yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, we, we love having interns, Molly. Interns are, are awesome in our part. We haven't had so many this last year just because of COVID. And so, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we been a while since I've had an intern and, and they're so helpful in, in so many ways and um, you know what one some of some advice I'd like to give for those that are maybe looking at a career in college athletics is to really find your niche in college athletics that you really really enjoy so whether that's marketing whether that's communications as a sports information director whether that's on you know on the business side of things uh, whether you're want to go into event management I mean there's a lot of a lot of a diverse um departments within an athletic department and so if if you find that niche that you really want to be a part of uh, you know go for it go for it but if you find within a couple of years that that's maybe not what you want to do but, but you still want to stay in college athletics then my my recommendation would be flexible enough to just kind of get out and start over it's really challenging to become a kind of a mid-level director in compliance for example and then shift over to marketing 
um, once you became, once you, you know, kind of get on the senior executive and leadership team, a little bit easier to kind of have oversight in those, some of those areas, but, but at mid-level director kind of positions, it's, it's a challenge. So, so I, I would, I would recommend find that niche and then kind of run down that path and see if you like it, go from there. But as far as qualities, I mean, flexibility is something we really need to see in someone, someone that has a lot of passion, um, but maybe, maybe, um, uh, not so much of, uh, you need to have a passion for everything, not just a, a fan of one particular area. You know, you kind of have to have a passion for the entire department right. and kind of look at it from a holistic view rather than just kind of a narrow, narrow, narrow view. Um, I also think that working in athletics is, is more of a lifestyle than it is a job. So you need yes. to understand that and, and recognize that there's going to be long nights and weekends and, and things like that. And, and that you have the support from family to, to do that. And uh, it's kind of fun though. your family gets to be a part of it too. I can't tell you how many games or NCAA tournaments or events I've been able to take my, my, my children and my wife to. It's been a lot of fun to have them part of that. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great industry. It's a lot of fun, but just a lot of passion, a lot of energy, and then just kind of have a focus of what you want to accomplish. And those are, those are my suggestions um, for how to get going. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it helps you figure out maybe what you don't want to do in a career as well when you have those entry level positions or internships. But I also think getting uh, that variety. I, I was a sports information director at the University of Kentucky, and I had the opportunity to be able to work there with all the different programs and the things that I learned. You're a wildcat. No, sir, I am not a wildcat. But I do, I had an amazing opportunity to work there. Um, no, I graduated from Loyola, New Orleans, a small liberal arts school uh, where I wrote as in crew. Uh, so it's, uh, but you know, that foundation really gave me a lot of amazing opportunity to be able to do research and to understand fact checking and um, and to understand media relations and how it works. So you'd be surprised some of the takeaways that you have and how it contributes to who you are and, and what you do today and in the future. All well, right, so. You, you, you know, I'm from Greeley, Colorado and I, uh, I went to Utah on purpose because it's such a great institution. And, at the end, you know what, I, I think what they, they have accomplished and what they do for not the athletes so much as as the arts and everything it stands for i mean cancer research everything yes it's 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 pretty you know outside the sports world it's pretty incredible institution it is we're so lucky we really are to have the university of utah in our salt lake community um, and even in the region so um, final topic, then we'll do a lightning round and then Q&A, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, sports carry such a great responsibility for diversity, equity, inclusion, commonly known as DEI. It's a business imperative that starts with leadership. So Charlie, tell us how the Colorado Rockies have been leading the way in this space. I'm not sure I understood the question. <laughs> oh, um, you know what, Charlie? Like the the kind of, you know, the athletes and how important diversity, equity, and inclusion are to them oh, oh, oh. and how they've taken a stand at some of your games and, yeah. and oh, using oh, their platform oh. and using their voice. Okay. Um, um, that's a good one. Um, okay, so... Um, our athletes are from all over the world, Dominica, yes. um, Japan, all over. And you know what? The, what they appreciate is their family being and their background of um, just being, you know, good to people. Yes. And so, so we, we we do have some some classes that they um buy into and you know it's in my opinion what's going on in the world i could get political but i'm not going to um is the fact of the matter is they they need to appreciate people mm -hmm. and appreciate their common sense and 
you know what? We we draft people that, uh, quite frankly, are God believing people, and um, I could get on my Christian sense, but um, I'm a Christian, strong, and that's the people that we. I hate that question. <laughs> Anyway, well, it sounds like family is very important in terms of the culture. Oh, it's life. totally, it's, 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 uh, it's all about family. I, I, I can I tell you that. all our players, families, and I, I know them and stuff, and they're very, very that's conservative. Important. That's important yeah. to you as a leader of the club and, and that you want everybody to know. And the fact that you're implementing training and providing these resources for your players and for your your team um you know the staff is incredible so thank you well the, the bottom line is they don't need to be a christian they don't need to be they can be whatever muslim they could be whatever they want as long as they agree with their family and take care of them yeah so Period. true and i want to make sure that annie and steve have the opportunity to um to um, answer that as well so steve how has utah athletics responded yeah it's uh you know it's a subject, a topic that's very important for us. It's very important for our student athletes. And, and we've made some really deep progress this last uh, year, year and a half or so in this, in this area. Um, we, we've created a group called the Utah Group for our student athletes. It's United Together Against Hate. Um, we've also created a group of administrators as well. That's the Utua Group. And it's uh, United to, uh, Together, or, uh, hold on one second. Uh, United Through Understanding and Action. That's what it is. Yeah, United Through Understanding and Action. And, and these two groups get together and, and really kind of share their thoughts on kind of the uh, topics of today and, and what's happening and, and, and talk about inclusion and diversity, equity, and so kind of those kind of things. And um, it's really, it's, it's given our athletes a platform to be able to share their concerns and, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's great. You know, it's, it's been, it's really neat to see that. Um, we, we've had an interesting uh uh, thought that came up recently. So we just hired a new COO and deputy uh, athletic director named Sharmel Green. She was a softball player with us in the early 90s. At 1991 was her last year here. And she was the only black female athlete in our entire athletic department in 1991. And um, it's that's sad. It's sad to hear that, you know, but uh, but here we are today and, and that's certainly not the case. And it's it's just, it's been it's gotten better and better, and, and uh, it's just exciting to see that. And we're excited to have her on board. I think she's going to be a really important piece of, uh, of moving forward, this, moving this initiative forward in the future. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're making some progress there, and it's, it's, it's exciting to see that. All great strides. You, you, know you know what, Steve? What I look forward to is when you don't have to say this is the first Black African-American woman yes. I, I, I look forward to when that's not even a conversation. Yeah. So, so good. So good. Good for you, Steve. Seriously, good for you. But you know what? That'll be nice when that doesn't even exist. Great, great call. Yep. Well said. So true. And Annie, to um, close things out with this topic, you and I are on a board together for Wise Utah Women in Sports and Events. Where I watched you stand up and create a new DEI position. Um, tell us briefly about it. Absolutely. So, um, you know, for those who aren't familiar, WISE, um, as Molly mentioned, Women in Sports and Events is a fantastic national resource for women. And that includes, you know, professionals who are either currently in the industry and are even just wanting to be in the industry, um, and even students. Um, who, who want to be in this business of sports. So it actually helps women navigate and grow um, their careers, foster networking and build connections, and then also you know, championing the, the hiring and advancement of women in this, this incredible industry. So there's 28 chapters across the country, including one here in Utah, where Molly and I are on the board. Um, and you know, to touch on you know, this new DEI position that we've added, um, after the murder of George Floyd, you know, it, it prompted this national movement that we all witnessed across the country. Um, and like so many organizations, you know, our chapter asked, what else can we do? What can we be doing better? Um, and this idea of adding a DEI role was born. So 
Um, I'm, I'm super passionate about my job. I love what I do, but as a woman of color, uh, this work is also very important, you know, personal and important to me. Um, so I, I raised my hand and said, you know, let's, let's dig into this. What, what can we do? And, um, our chapter does so, so much incredible work, um, to support and advance women in the workplace. But, um, often, you know, these conversations or strategies around DEI fail to include the realities for women of color. Um, that they do have different experiences um, in the workplace, you know, whether that's the pay gap or advancement or the interviewing process or, or even just representation around the table, um, you know, as, as Charlie and Steve were just talking about. So, so as brands and organizations, you know, we need to start including them as, as we talk about the advancement of women, it, including in the sports industry. And, and I would say, especially in the sports industry, you know, of all places, um, the business side is very male dominated. And then you look at the athlete side and you look back in history and, and the athletes that have used their voices and their platforms um, to call for actionable change, you know, just, just last week, you know, we all were remembering the life of Hank Aaron to, to Jackie Robinson to, to today with, um, you know, Colin Kaepernick and Megan Rapino, and there's, there's just in LeBron James, there's so many athletes that are using their platforms to advocate for change. And so, I, I just think that sports is going to be such an important part um, and will continue to be um, of, of this work. Annie, thank you for sharing that experience. And um, now, and it's already moved so quickly, there's just so much great information. Um, we'd like to go through a lightning round um, where each panelist will answer with one or two quick sentences, quick like lightning. <laughs> All right, so Steve will start I'm not very you. good at that, by the way. I know. Okay, so Charlie, you're going to go last, so you can think of your um, <laughs> answers. Okay, so we'll do okay. Steve, Annie, Charlie in the same order. What podcast, sport documentary, or book has left a great impression on you, or has been influential for your mindset? Okay. Uh, wow, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, I, uh, the last dance was really interesting to me. I, I, uh, yeah. I, I recently watched that and, uh, you know, just okay, I'm going to cut you off right there, buddy. Last dance. All right, Andy, go <laughs> lightning round. Oh, uh, okay. Um, okay. This is yeah. not sports related, but, uh, it's a book called the memo by Minda hearts. Oh, nice. Charlie, you got a favorite. Oh, Armageddon without a doubt. Ooh, I like that. Again. No nice. Doubt. Nice work. Okay, you guys, you're giving us all homework to do. And I'm going to throw in mine. And this isn't because of Charlie, but I tell this to a lot of people I mentor. The Battered Bastards of Baseball. It's on Netflix. Oh. <laughs> it's one of my favorite, personal favorite sport documentaries about the Portland Mavericks. Uh, uh, but by the way, I, I, I know. You got it, a story? I, I know it very well. Yes. Yes. Are you, you're not but, in but, it. But, Are you, but, I don't but, remember seeing you in it. By the way, just so you know, it took place not in Portland. It actually took place in Bend, Oregon. That was in Bend? Oh, we're yeah. going to have to have an offline, Charlie. I love that part, part, part of the filming was in Bend. Other parts were in Portland. Okay. But, yeah. Good to know. Thank you. Okay. Next yeah. up. How do you recharge to stay in charge? Like exercise, meditation, Netflix. Steve? Uh, I do one of two things. I just try to escape and maybe hang out with the kids and play some games with them, or I go on a hike. I really enjoy hiking. Ooh, nice. Annie? Oh, uh, yeah, two things also. Uh, I work out at home. I have an app now that I'm using, now that we're all stuck at home. Um, and then I also listen to a podcast from, her name is Morgan Harper Nichols. She's very relaxing to listen to. Ooh, nice. Ooh, Ooh that yeah. is nice. Charlie, how do, you, I, how do you recharge to stay in charge? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I go to the ballpark and I just go out on green grass and I just, I will lay down on oh. green grass and just. Because you can. Because I can. I love it. Very, very, very well put. Yeah, because I can. So yes, I, I nothing like green grass. Living in Colorado, Utah, and all. Um, I and, and and living down in San Diego. I know I'm taking more time, but 
it's all green down there. I'm like, no, I want it. When it first green grass comes up, I go lay on it. I love it. Okay, take a picture next time. We want to see it. Or have somebody take a picture it. of you. Okay, <laughs> you and it. final lightning round question. Favorite Utah sport memory, Steve? Oh, 2008 Sugar Bowl, definitely. Uh, I would have said the 1998 National Championship game, your Wildcats, Molly. It ruined that one. So, but, uh, I didn't bring that up. You did. <laughs> But the 2008 Super Bowl was a memory. Um, I was my mom and dad were down there with me, and uh, that's one that uh, I'll always remember for sure. Awesome, Annie. How about you? Oh, I'm gonna have to say the same. I was a student during the 2008 season, so yeah, cheering on the uh, football team from the mess. Uh, nothing beats that. Oh, that's great, Charlie. Favorite youth sport memory that you can remember. Uh, this this is not going to be very good for anybody, but um, beating the crap out of Frank Gutierrez, who, by the way, was our quarterback, and he came into our Capsic fraternity, and I had to punch him out. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you are a sketch. Okay, it's time for Q&A from the audience. The sports thing, you know, any anytime going to the, the, the ballpark and Rice, I mean, it was, uh, we we had some fun there and stuff. It was, it was always good stuff. I love it. Thank you. Okay, officially time for Q&A. Question from the audience. How, oh, do gosh. You, I know. how do you evaluate the value of sports sponsorships and how do you allocate the budget you have to get the most for your brand in this new time? Sounds like somebody's writing a thesis. Who would like to give a quick answer to that? We have about five minutes left. So we'd like to throw in a couple more questions too. You, you know what? I'll, I'll throw some out there. You okay. know, we have, we have taken, um, we, we've researched this and how how much um, money is spent towards our viewership and stuff. And you know what? As, as a as a sponsor, Annie could probably answer this better than me. But um, the fact of the matter is, how much how much viewership do you get Ooh. through it, and how much does it make sense to them? You know what? I think I think it's I think it's credible. I think I think you have to be um, wise about where you spend it and how you do it. But guess what? Sports is is strong, and it's so. it's going to always be strong. And my guess is that if you spend it in the right directions, you can get your money out of it. Yeah. Sport brings us together, you know, virtually through the broadcast and hopefully one day together again in the ballparks and the stadiums and the arenas. You know, look, look at Alex Smith on, on 60 minutes the other night for, for Washington. That, that was huge for yeah. them and mainly because he's such an incredible guy that I don't know if you all know him or not, but he, he's, he's, He's a testament to Utah, and Utah got a lot of play for that. Yes. And and I wish they won the game, but you know what? It, it's it is Molly. We're it's all gonna it's, watch it's, it. It's a, it's a big de- it, it's a big deal. It so. is. All right, Steve or Annie, what is the biggest money spender in sports that no one talks about? Biggest uh, money spender in sports that no one talks about. That no one talks about, huh? Uh, and maybe just because people don't know that it costs that much money. It definitely costs a lot of money. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 a significant investment to to move teams from one location to another, and 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 you know, behind the scenes, the production of those events is quite significant as well. I don't think people realize how expensive it is to, you know, police and parking and ushers and field crew and I mean it's it's a it's a it's an extensive and really expensive uh production for 
for putting on an event. So I think maybe traveling and just and behind the scenes things is sometimes something that people overlook. Yeah, like facility improvement and even just to give them Wi-Fi access in your sport venues. Right. Yeah, that's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, just for the stadium, for example, that would be a five to ten million dollar investment to Ooh. bring in Wi-Fi for sure. There you go. All right. Um, Annie, anything you'd like to tack on from the sponsorship perspective? Yeah, you know, I'll just say, you know, in addition to Steve, I think that event component, I think there, there's just so many, there's so many hidden costs in that, you know, even from a sponsor standpoint, if we're planning an activation or a hospitality event, there's, there's so many factors that go into that and it, it, it really adds up. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you to our hey, remarkable hey, hey, Molly, Molly, you got an add on, Charlie? Since you, since you didn't ask me, Little League. Little League. Oh. That, that to me is the underbelly of it all. I mean, uh, uh, there's so many families and stuff that are involved in Little League, any sport, baseball, yeah. football, whatever. Uh, uh, I mean, there's so many families going everywhere for Little League. And, and, and I think that's, that's important. And I think that's something that Annie knows. Um, that because they support it, I know that. Yeah. And um, little leagues, you know, kids growing up. Yeah. So when they come door to door looking, you know, that's individual little entrepreneurs. Don't forget to support don't, them. Donate it. Donate Please it. buy that candy bar or whatever because it 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 you're creating little mini CEOs and providing really great foundations for them in terms of being on a team. That's brilliant. Thank you. And and thank you. Our panelists are so amazing today of talking about the business of sports. Annie, Steve, and Charlie, we thank you so much. We're grateful for all your insights that you've shared with us. And special thanks to the Eccles Business Forum for inviting us to be here with you today to represent sports business. And as a proud graduate of my small yet mighty liberal arts school in New Orleans, Loyola, go Wolfpack, I envy the opportunity and power of connection that you all have. And I want you to think about this. Be proud and supportive of this alumni network and what they do for you. And help one another out, not only by wearing your masks, but showing your youth pride because it's a great day to be a youth. Thanks so much. Chelsea, turning it back to you. There you go. I love it, Charlie. Thank you so much to our panelists and to Molly for moderating. Uh, if you would like to connect with our panelists, please see their socials up here um, and ask them any questions that you didn't get answered today. Please follow our Eccles alum at Eccles Alumni social media to stay tuned for future events and forums. Thank you again for taking your time today out to watch our forum. <laughs>